everybody. My name is Ken Sharp. I'm one of the IPHA board members and I'm also a division director at the Iowa Department of Public Health for Acute Disease Prevention, Emergency Response and Environmental Health. I've been asked to moderate the uh, 2 o'clock session, which we're a little bit behind schedule, but um, I understand that we've got some flexibility in the presentations today, so if we need to compress or expand, uh, we can do so. So this afternoon's session is titled Key Environmental Health Issues and Opportunities from Research uh, to Practice. And I'm going to just do a very quick bio. Um, I hope that the three of you are aware of the bios that were provided for you, but I'm going to just read them. I, I cringe at having people do this for me, but I'm uh, following the orders that I was given. So um, when we got together, uh, the, the four of us got together last week and spoke briefly about how to organize this. And really, uh, what you have in front of you today is a couple of current issues, particularly um, related to animal feeding operations and then uh, a newer issue of um, uh, harmful algal blooms or microcystin toxins and those types of issues. And then um, we're also going to have a presentation on some work that academia has done in the central states to try to raise issue on uh, some of the, the um, issues related to climate change and, and um, environmental health concerns. Uh, so uh, with no further ado, I'll just do a quick bio for each of the three of them, and then I'm going to have them come up and do their respective presentations. So our first presenter is Dr. Uh, or David Osterberg. David's a former Iowa State Representative who was chairman of the House Energy and Environmental Protection Committee as well as Agricultural Committee. Uh, David holds a, a master's degree in water resources management and another in agricultural economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Go Hawkeyes! Uh, he is a professor in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Iowa where he teaches a seminar in environmental health policy as well as the department's only undergraduate course in inter, uh, introduction to occupational and environmental health. Uh, his accomplishments include uh, service uh, activities and specifically engagement out, uh, in engagement outside of the university have been recognized by the College of Public Health with a uh, 2009 Faculty Service Award and the 2011 Board of Advisors Award for Faculty Achievement and Community Engagement. In addition to his work at the University of Iowa, uh, David is uh, also founder and past executive director of the Iowa Policy Project, a nonprofit policy research organization. David and I have worked together on a variety of topics over a number of years, and uh, it's always uh, a, a, a very rich discussion about the environmental health issues that we face in, in the state. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to David in just a moment, but let me first also introduce um, Mary Skopik. Mary is the executive director of the Iowa Lakeside Laboratory uh, Regents Resource Center. Uh, prior to joining Lakeside in December of 2016, Mary spent nearly 20 years developing water quality monitoring programs for the state of Iowa, and she has an interdis interdisciplinary uh, PhD in environmental sciences from the University of Iowa, again, go Hawkeyes, uh, and is a lifelong Iowan. And uh, Pam, sorry, um, if we've got any other boiler makers, we, you know, we'll, we'll let you give a quick hurrah right now. Okay. <laughs> Um, <coughs> sorry, Pam. Uh, and then uh, Dr. David Karad Hari uh, has been at uh, Drake University in Des Moines since the fall of 2000 and currently serves as director of the Environmental Science and Policy Program. He has uh, co authored a series of three environmental science textbooks and has published modeling uh, work in fields as uh, diverse as carbon sequestration, butterfly movement, cell signaling and the psychological drivers of overconsumption. I'm, I'm David, I'm not even sure what that is, but I'll, we'll learn from that, I'm sure, later. His uh, current research focuses in the field of uh, ecological economics. Uh, he also teaches a range of courses at Drake, including introductory environmental science, climate change, quantitative methods, and environmental choice, uh, environmental mod uh, modeling, uh, ecological economics. Uh, he's led Drake seminars on uh, economic development, and environmental sustainability, uh, sustainability in Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Ecuador, and has spent the last two J-term sessions uh, leading service learning seminars in the Galapagos Islands. So got a nice right, wide range of uh, expertise and, and presenters uh, here with you this afternoon. So with no further ado, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. My name is David Osterberg, and uh, as, as Ken said, we've worked together on a bunch of things, including on climate change. And so um, when Janine asked me to put together this panel, and it's sort of on newer stuff, uh, as Ken said, some of the stuff isn't so newer. It isn't so newer when it comes to confined animal feeding operations. And 
it's certainly not newer when it comes to any of these things because climate change uh, we've known there's been good evidence out from since at about the 1990s that climate change is an issue more and more does it happen every day and the first slide you want to do the slides for me great since some of you are from places other than Iowa I want to show you where hogs are raised now this is animal agriculture in general but I want to talk specifically around hogs there and there uh, Iowa produces about a third of all the hogs produced in the nation at any one time there are seven times as many hogs alive as there are human beings in this state and we know that each of those hogs produces an awful lot of weight a lot of waste because they're growing so fast they're taking on weight six months they'll gain 200 pounds that's a lot so that gives you an idea where things are but it is it does move into Nebraska and into Kansas and northern Missouri uh, especially in northern Missouri there are lots of also a lot of hogs raised next one and in Iowa it tends to be a little concentrated too sort of here and here and here and these are individual feeding operations I mean you only have to go back to about 1970 when you find that most farmers raised hogs 65,000 farmers uh, raised hogs in 1965 each of them around 200 and now we have maybe 10 or 15,000 and each of them raises 5,000 it's been a very big change and it's very a very big change in the footprint on the environment because that waste has to be taken care of and when it is taken care of it is not sent through your normal sewage treatment plant it is put on the ground to try to bring back some nutrients and if it's done correctly it's a good idea the chances of it being done correctly are not that good next uh, give you some examples you find these kinds of buildings sometimes with a lagoon although that's less common now and these would be where animals are raised the problem is it's often very close to something like a river or a, a very vulnerable area next next slide just to give you an idea how many there might be in one area here's one two three four all in a fairly tight area and if you are the person who lives there you may be finding that you as a neighbor are receiving some of the outputs of that particular animal feeding operation next and that's what goes on inside them uh, in the United States uh, this is how we raise the sows those sows don't move around those sows have a life in that stanchion pretty much next um, there's a bunch of health related research on whether or not confined animal feeding operations have some effect on neighbors around them we've had a, a good data for a very long time on workers inside those and there are all kinds of respiratory, respiratory diseases that come about meeting being that close to that many animals for that many hours the question though is how about neighbors and in 2002 there was a study done here in Iowa and it was an interesting study because Tom Vilsack was the governor at the time and Tom figured he was the boss of everybody so he could say I want you at the College of Public Health at the University of Iowa and you at College of Agriculture at ISU to get together and spend hours and hours and months trying to come up with this, some answer some questions about whether or not we know enough to say it is a health effect for neighbors to be that close to animal feeding operations and what we decided at that time was it might be that's as close as we could get there were not very many studies at the time and in 19 this is 2002 you can see the uh, that 2002 we could say you might I think the evidence is much stronger today much stronger next slide part of it came out of a big deal the Pew Commission on Industrial Farm Animal Production in America worked for months a small number of folks were put on this panel 
They received lots of information, kind of the way the um, uh, other kind of scientific bodies work. And they decided that the current industrial animal production system often poses unacceptable risks to public health. Next study I'm going to talk about is one that I'm involved in. In fact, I was involved with the first one also. And James Merchant was my boss. He's the former dean at the College of Public Health. And he's the primary author of a study that we did in January where we found that the evidence is so much better now that there are health effects associated with living next to animal feeding operation. And Jim's expertise, he's one of these medical doctors that is also a PhD. I don't know how people want to get that. I don't know, I, I guess I don't know how people want to spend that much time in school. I don't know if it's getting to be that much smarter, but uh, Jim does this kind of work. And when it comes to things like asthma, we know a lot more. Now we don't know everything. And if you could do the next slide, Ken. Um, uh, but these are not the only reports out there. This is, there is a pretty interesting scientific debate going on. O'Connor found no, no effect. O'Connor, though, uh, looking at 3,000 different studies, found 14 that were meritorious. That's a pretty small number because she wanted almost to do this. I give Mary a placebo and I give Dave the medicine and let's follow them for a few years and find out if we can measure stuff. That would be great if you could do that in environmental health, but you can't. And that's what this other Nachman study says is that this is, was just a silly way of deciding to figure out how you're going to do this research unless you didn't want to find anything and then you did a good job of not finding anything. Here's an example of the kind of studies that there are. Next slide is one in a very good journal done by people at the University of Iowa done back in 2006 and next slide your hypothesis was that we hypothesize that a rural U.S. environment may not be that protective against uh, asthma and airway diseases. You kind of expect that asthma is something that poor people in cities get, and if you're looking outside in the wide open countryside, maybe it's going to be a lot better. But the hypothesis was if you find one of those, and it happens to be very close to one of these confined animal feeding operations, we may be able to see an effect. Next slide. And they saw quite an effect, about a two and a half times increase in asthma between two schools. Next slide. And it even got a little bit of attention. Using the broadest definition of asthma, it affected 24.6% of participants at the Suddy School, 11.7% of another school, of another school which was by definition far enough away so you wouldn't find the same effect and by definition then was not built in the same year. By definition you couldn't really control for smoking. You could measure it and find out whether there were big differences or not in parent smoking or who had cats and cat dander and all of those other things. But it's a pretty good study but it alone, it, the, the, the biggest problem with it, too far apart, Physician diagnosed asthma, can't say it. You know, one physician will say it's asthma, the next person will say maybe. And so for that reason, this is not rock bottom solid and I'm going to depend on this, but the point is, if you put together 50 or 100 of those kinds of study, you get the weight of evidence and that weight of evidence is getting closer and closer to say there are health effects. Next slide. Um, and it's not that these are not nuisances. Everybody knows that they've been a nuisance for a very long time. Remember when uh, our governor asked, he asked if there were health effects. Um, at least juries in North Carolina have decided that there is a big enough nuisance so that 10 plaintiffs were given $75,000 each for living right next to these large Smithfield Corporation confinement operations. 
And then the jury decided that I think it's time for punitive damages and each of those families was given $5 million for $50 million. Settled, you can see when, April, just a month ago. Next slide. When it comes to antibiotic resistance, the World Health Organization, and I guess I don't have to say to people in this audience, these are not a lot of activist radical types. Stodgy old institution, World Health Organization, come on. Finally, it is making noise like this. They're saying when it comes to our loss of antibiotics that uh, antimicrobial resistance threatens the effective prevention and treatment of ever-increasing range of infections. And it's bacteria or parasites or viruses or fungi. And here, this is, this is their statement. A post-antibiotic era in which common infections and minor injuries can kill, far from being an apocalyptic fantasy, is real. We're running out of antibiotics. And 70% of the antibiotics are used in animal agriculture and used in a way that you're just asking for it because it's prophylactic doses in feed and water because you have so many of these animals jammed right next together that you don't want to risk one of them getting sick because then 1,249 animals get sick and you lose a herd. We're asking for it. And animal agriculture is a big part of that. And only now is the World Health Organization being able to say something about it. It's only been in the last two years. Another health effect. Next. By the way, there are two ways of going after antibiotic resistance. And our FDA is doing something now. And it's called Guidance for Indus Industry Number 213. And because it's animal agriculture, it is totally voluntary. That's how we treat animal agriculture, totally voluntary. When you look at the Danish system, from 1994 to 2016, antibiotic use in animals reduced by half. At the same time, you expand those herds. Don't tell me that there's only one way to raise hogs, and we have to do it this way, and I'm sorry if it's going to cause some problems. The Danes expanded the number of animals they produce while cutting in half the antibiotics they're using. Next. Uh, just a slide to show you, could it happen? Remember I showed you that, that confined animal feeding operation real close to uh, a river? Yeah, it could happen. You could get it underwater and uh, send all those hogs and all that feces down, downstream. Next. Of course, the Cedar Rapids, uh, at the same time, the Cedar Rapids sewage treatment plant went underwater for six weeks, something like that. A long time. Another thing in, in general in water quality, we have hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is measured in uh, areas of, area of, in square miles. So our goal is to try to bring it down to here, which is the size of Connecticut. And it's actually up here, closer to the size of Massachusetts. Last year was the biggest outbreak ever. Animal agriculture responsible, mainly it's mainly applying nitrogen fertilizer to cornland is the main, main problem in this. And since we have 13 or 14 million acres of that, but 15%, according to USDA, could be from animal agriculture. Question? Sorry, for us community health people, can you define Yes, I can. It's, um, it's not poisoning an area. It's far from it. It's enriching it so much that bacteria, that, that algae just have a field day. They have everything they need. They have sunlight, they have heat, they have nutrients, but then they also have a lifestyle, a life expectancy. And when they die, bacteria take them, eat all their waste products and them and drain all of the oxygen out of the entire system. So there is a gigantic dead zone off the bottom of the Mississippi River and many other rivers, not, not just here. Ours, uh, ours used to be the second biggest because the Black Sea was the biggest, and uh, um, animal, ag animal agriculture and other agriculture collapsed in the Soviet Union, 
and uh, we are now number one uh, because that's one way to fix it. <laughs> not probably not the best. I'm going to do a few more of these slides. Um, next slide. Uh, Iowa Environmental Council talked about nutrients in water and the fact that it's not methemoglobinemia, blue baby syndrome anymore. It's a lot of birth defects. It's a lot of uh, bowel cancers, with, uh, mainly with uh, older women. Next. Uh, we have something that's setting up Mary because it's the second of these is cyanobacteria. And the reason that we know this term is because this is the kind of algae that produces a toxin that can be very dangerous. This is Toledo's water supply being surrounded by it. So Toledo, Ohio lost its water supply for four days, completely lost it. It isn't like a boil order where you have to treat things differently. You cannot touch that water. And no, they could not. That's why the EPA is moving stronger on this issue. Next. Um, because of all of these things, if you live next to one of these facilities, you will find that the value of your home is going to decrease. This is uh, from the Des Moines Register, written by Bob Juber and Donna Juber, talking about here they were in their nice retirement home they spent a lot of money on, and all of a sudden, plop, comes after they were there, comes one of these confined, an confined animal feeding operations which they think is decreasing the value of their home. Next slide, it is, and there's good research on it, saying that you're uh, probably, and this was a survey article from a whole lot of studies saying about a 26% reduction in the home you just bought if somebody moves close of you. And if, if, if they're right downwind and they're real close, it could, you could lose 88% of the value of your home. It's serious stuff. And one of the studies looked at in that survey article, uh, survey article was uh, in the appraisal journal. So it's, it isn't a public health journal, but it, it's people who are interested in this kind of stuff, like what's the value of a home in a rural area. I trust an economist to do that rather than a public health person. They know where to look. Next. So uh, one of the ones that looked at the Kilpatrick article was from Iowa State University. And this is one I used to quote a lot, August 2003, Sechi Babcock and uh, Hingis Sechi and Babcock, where they found that, yeah, you're going to lose some value in your home, but the fact that you're a neighbor, you may be able to use the power that you have threatening a nuisance suit if they don't behave a little better, right? That's what this study said. And uh, more accountable because of nuisance suits. Next slide until the Iowa legislature got rid of your ability to do that. They did it one year ago. They were looking at things like $5 million per, per, per plaintiff suits, and they tried their best to make it, imp make it impossible for you to win as much as you should, and very much anyway. You'll get the value of your house. You'll get a little more than that, but not much. And that was their purpose. Next one. It's in a long line of traditions. When the animal agriculture industry asks for something, they get it. The ag-gag law was that if you think there's a violation going on inside a confinement or in a big uh, plant killing animals, you go inside, maybe you work for PETA or some organization like that, you go in and uh, surreptitiously take pictures and then you broadcast them and then you go to jail. That's the law in Iowa. We're not interested in finding whistleblowers explaining the abuses going on. We're trying to make sure that we get that guy that did it. Now, next slide. That was been struck down, by the way, in other states. Not yet in Iowa. It's up. There's a, a case that was only brought in March to look at Iowa's ag-gag law, but an almost identical one was struck down in Idaho in 2015, and within the last four months, it also went to the appeals court, it's federal court, appeals court where they said, yeah, this is completely taking away your First Amendment rights. We're not going to let you do that. But the point is, they try, and the legislature continues to try to take away the rights of neighbors, because they want to support this agricultural industry, and there is only one way to produce hogs in Iowa, they say, 
all kinds of data <laughs> to the contrary. Next, where am I? Yeah, the latest one is Kim Reynolds uh, just signed another one that said if you're a WIC recipient and you, uh, you know, you're on WIC, we really want to make sure that you take care of your new baby. Well, if you go someplace like a farmer's market and uh, buy some of those cage-free eggs, that market better have regular eggs for Mr. DeCoster or otherwise it's a violation. Yes, that's right. It's based on cost. Yes, but is that but if you decide to go, can you buy those cage-free eggs which cost four dollars and fifty cents a dozen? You can. Fairway, I, if you walk into Fairway. Yes. And there's cage-free eggs. There also has to be. There have to be. The consumer has a choice to buy a cheaper egg, so they choose. And except, that's right. Except the Grocers Association. I don't often quote them. They said this is a total violation of people's right to choose. But the vendors no. can choose to participate in our program. That's right. They can choose. They can choose. They can choose. But my point is. Are you defending that industry or are you defending people having the right to buy lower priced eggs? In our area, the WIC people who identify that they could buy protein from Whole Foods for a dollar or whatever it was, they could buy protein for a dollar or whatever it was for that dozen of dollar, yeah. a non-cage yes. versus four dollars. Yes. Okay, and that. I don't know about yours. Well, I, I well I know I, I'm just saying. That's why we advocated as public health with our legislation to have that. So that choice was there. Uh huh. Okay, good. Sorry. No, no, no. That's a that's a wonderful Sorry. point. I'm just saying. Does it also seem to be in a tradition of defending the industry no matter what? I I'm a farmer, raised in farms, <laughs> still farm, and we have hog confinement. Yes. No, That's right, and you might have ho regulations because you have more than 2,500 hogs. Ours is a 2,400 head, and we bring in, in 4,800 at a time of little guys. That's right. But it's a 2,400 head. And the reason it's 2,400 head and not 2,500 head is because you just got out of the biggest regulation by not having to get a plan to build your facility. Well, listen, I know the law. 2,500. You have to have a number of hoops. Twenty-four ninety-nine. You get out of a bunch of hoops. Then you get twelve hundred and forty-nine, and then you even get out of a newer management plan. Maybe they need to change the law. Well, of course they need to change the law. But what are the chances of changing the law? And that is the point. Because the buildings are set up for twelve and twenty. Yeah, of course they're set up so they get out of regulation. How do you think, do you think that's exactly the right number, 24, 1,249? I mean, I've had people come to my talks and say, 1,249. Why? So you get out of regulation, that's why. Next slide. I think I'm almost done anyway. This is good. No, no, I, I, I like the fact that we got to a point that uh, we don't want to hear from this guy anymore anyway, because I think we got the point. More protections for neighbors. Uh, we don't need to even do that. Well, here, the last slides are kind of fun. Because uh, there are 20, now 23 counties who say our regulations are wrong and we want to have them changed. And when they went to the legislature with those, nothing happened. Fifteen bills were proposed, not one got through. You can ask that why don't we do that and why don't we have some kind of reason. Next slide. Next slide, that's all on Denmark. That's what I see is happening in the legislature. You have neighbors on one side, and then you have the industry on the other side. I don't think it's a fair teeter-totter. And, and I'm not speaking just for as some academic out of the University of Iowa, or emeritus professor, no longer at the University of Iowa. 
But as somebody that listens to county supervisors who say, the regulations we have are weak and sometimes non-existent, and we have made sure that we don't even know if they're being obeyed by cutting the number of inspectors at DNR from 24 down to nine, as we double the number of CAFOs. EPA made us move it back up to 13. We don't regulate this industry. And when we don't, those potential health effects become more real. Uh, for those of you who may not know that much about blue-green algae and cyanobacteria, uh, just a really quick primer on that. Uh, blue-green algae have been around for a billion years. So when we talk about water quality issues, this is not a new organism. This is not a necessarily a new thing. Um, but they were really important to the, the creation of, of the atmosphere of, of Earth. Um, they can produce, uh, they're a photosynthetic bacteria, and they can have blue, green, red, brown pigments. So when we talk about blue-green algae, um, oftentimes we see issues with algae that are uh, brown and, and red as well. Found in fresh and salt water, uh, many can fix nitrogen, which is important if you're a, if you're a plant or a plant-like thing, uh, but not all. And so when we talk about solutions to blue-green algae, we need to remember that a lot of the, these cannot fix nitrogen. And in particular, microcystis, which is the most sort of prevalent and one we talk about the most, does not fix nitrogen. Um, so keep that in mind. They can have resting spores, so they can have those spores sitting in the bottom of the lake over winter, and then when the water temperatures get warm, they can bounce back. Um, they're mobile, so they can, buoy they can regulate their buoyancy. They can go down in the water column if they want to. They can come up in the water column, uh, which helps them out-compete other sort of green algae and other organisms. They can harvest those nutrients from the sediment. And then also, one of the biggest challenges is they have this really nifty adaptation to produce toxins. Um, and there's a lot of research in the toxin production. Um, but right now, we're up over 100 variants of different toxins. So microcystin, for example, one toxin, has more than 100 variants, which makes testing for this a little bit challenging because it's, the science is constantly evolving. And we're really looking at um, a couple hundred different things. And just a picture from Black Hawk Lake. This is kind of a typical scene that you might see in Iowa in the summer where the green kind of pea soupy lake and then this kind of smurfy blue um, scum that's on the, the rocks. So uh, again, if we just keep talking about the cyanotoxins in particular, um, a number of different effects on the human body, including things like dermal reactions, so uh, skin lesions or rashes. Um, we can have liver and kidney toxicity as well as neurotoxic uh, issues. So um, the, the contact with the organism can happen while you're swimming, and so you get it on your skin. Um, it can happen when you're playing and swimming, you ingest a little bit of it. Um, or you can drink it in your drinking water or eat it in uh, supplements. One of the things that's really kind of alarming with blue-green algae is that it's kind of a fun uh, supplement for health people. And, uh, and I actually had someone call me when I was working for the DNR because they were producing um, blue-green algae supplements, but they had no idea whether the toxin was in their supplements. And so they're, they're selling these, and we don't know if there's necessarily toxins in them. And they were being responsible and asking to do some testing the problem is that sometimes the algae, or these blue-green algae um, produce, it's actually a bacteria, sometimes they produce the toxin and sometimes they don't. And so if I go and test a lake today, uh, that particular blue-green algae may be producing the toxin. And if I go back a week later, it may not be. And so it's a really challenging if you think about the supplement issue, whether or not you've got uh, that in your supplement. Um, there's a number of impacts, so obviously there's the pu public health aspect, which you guys are obviously interested in today. Um, we have known about the impacts for animal health for a long time. Sheep are really sensitive, dogs are very sensitive, um, but the, the human health uh, research and interest has really come on more lately in the, the 2000s. David mentioned hypoxia, so again, uh, these things bloom, they are very productive, and then when they die, the bacteria that consume them can create those hypoxic conditions, and you can get fish kills, both from direct toxicity as well as from that hypoxia where you simply just don't have enough oxygen in that lake or that stream. Uh, there's water treatment costs that go with that. They, they often have a taste and odor issue, so um, water suppliers are having to get rid of that taste and odor because their customers obviously don't like skunky tasting water, uh, and so that can be a problem. And then um, just from a water aesthetic, if you're at a lake and it's green, uh, that's maybe not so pleasant to swim or recreate in or own uh, 
lakeshore property next to that. Although I am often surprised by the tolerance of Iowans to swim in green water. Um, <laughs> I was once at uh, Storm Lake and the, there was a really blue green, like the water was blue, there was scum coming up on the lake shore and there were these toddlers playing in it. And it's kind of stringy and fun looking and it's blue and the moms were chatting and I just said, I don't think you want your toddlers in this because the toddlers thought it was actually pretty cool. Um, so I'm sometimes surprised by the fact that people will still um, touch that. Um, and dogs really are drawn to those scums. And so we really worry about dogs consuming the scums because they like nasty smelling things. Um, so they'll consume, <laughs> they'll consume the toxins um, in those scums that are washing up on the lakeshore. And then there's just a variety of quality of life things. So you lose your recreational opportunities, uh, the property values are impacted, tax revenues, and then employment along those lakes and rivers that have blue-green algae. Um, if we talk about Iowa's program, uh, we had, I think, one of the first programs in the nation, um, partly because I got a call as a DNR employee in 2004, uh, there were a number of dead geese along Carter Lake in western Iowa. So Carter Lake is actually physically in Nebraska because the Missouri River took a change in course, left Carter Lake in Nebraska, but the Carter Lake Iowans said, no, we're Iowa. And so nobody in Iowa ever thought about Carter Lake until we had this blue-green algae bloom that killed these geese. And at that time, in 2004, I get this call, we have dead geese, what are you gonna do about it? I'm like, geese die all the time. You know, I don't know what we're gonna do about it. Um, but we knew we had a bloom, and so we started taking some samples from microcystin, found levels that were elevated, not, not especially high considering some of the levels we've seen today, but it started us down this course of thinking about blue-green algae and blue-green algae toxin. Um, the next year, we had a situation where Big Creek Lake, which is 20 miles from Des Moines, had a big bloom. So nobody cares about, I shouldn't say this, but you know, people didn't necessarily worry about Carter Lake because it wasn't a popular area in Iowa. Um, but when Big Creek and Des Moines get impacted, people get kind of excited. Um, so we started doing monitoring for blue-green algae in 2005 because of that bloom, and we already had an existing E. coli beach monitoring program. So we just layered this in on top of it. Um, so the sampling design was focusing at beaches because that's where we assumed that the contact with the algae would happen or the blue-green um, algae. We did weekly samples, and the way that we did the samples is we had these transects. So if you start at the beach, um, we're taking a sample at the ankle because that's where your toddler is going to play and sit. Um, then out to knee deep because that's where people kind of hang out that aren't really swimming and don't want to get their hair wet. Um, all the way out to chest deep water because that's where people who are actually immersing their heads in the water are at. And the protocol was taking nine of these samples from kind of one side of the beach to the other, compositing it all together, and then taking a subsample to look at E. coli. And then we started to look at the toxin levels, too, for microcystin. Um, one of the things that we noticed, though, is that sometimes you would get scums that would kind of wash up in different areas. Um, if we had swimming ropes, sometimes you'd have the scums along the swimming ropes. So if we saw a scum that wasn't being sampled by this transect, we would also take a scum sample uh, to get sort of the worst case scenario for folks. And so just some examples of what that would look like. Um, it was designed for rapid turnaround. So we wanted this to be something that people would make decisions about swimming. So sampling on Monday or Tuesday, results on um, Thursday or Friday. We really tried to push that to Thursday and really done from Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day, assuming that that was kind of the primo time that people would be recreating in Iowa. Um, we decided to use 20 micrograms per liter as our threshold, and that was based on some WHO studies that were done that said 20 micrograms per liter was really the way to go. Some people were looking at cell density. So if you had a lot of cells, a lot of scum, then you would put a, an advisory out. But we really said we want the toxin level because, again, you can have a lot of the cells, but if they're not producing toxin, people shouldn't worry about that. Um, and conversely, there may not be a scum, the, the cells have all died, and all this toxin is broken out of those cells. You can have no cells, no really scummy areas, but really high toxin levels. So we wanted to use the toxin as our decision rule. Um, next slide. And then this is the advisory policy based in 2016. I left DNR in 2016. They made some changes in 2017. So all in terms of protocol and, and advisory. So everything I'm talking about is from 05 to 16 because that's the consistent protocol and, and advisory level. 
Um, basically, the advisory policy said if we didn't see any microcystin, we collect samples. If it was over 2,000 micrograms per liter, we would say do not contact this water. Essentially, shut the beach down. Um, if it was over 20, we would put out an advisory and we would contact the Iowa Department of Public Health and then we'd resample. And once we dropped below 20, we tried to say we could be swimming there. Next slide. Um, one of the challenges that we had, though, is if the level that we see increased illness is above 20, is 19 okay? Is 18 and a half okay? At what level do you start to go, you know, it could be at 18 today, and then it's like today, it's hot and sunny. That thing that's going at 18 might be at 40 tomorrow. So I wanted to hedge my bets a little bit. And so one of the things we did is if it was above 2,000, you'd get the red sign at your beach. If it was above 20, you'd get the yellow sign. But then we added the black and white sign that said, you know, we're between 10 and 20. We maybe want to give you an indication that this stuff is here. Um, and that if it is here, you maybe want to just stay out just to be uh, proactive. So the park staff would put up signs. We let Iowa Department of Public Health know. We had a website, and then we had a beach monitoring hotline that people could call. Uh, we did not, when I was still there, go to the phone app thing, but that was kind of coming at us to think about having more immediate information for folks. All right, next one. So what did we learn over the course of those, of those years? So if we look at the number of advisories using the same number of beaches, and it was essentially 40 beaches, um, more or less, because we'd have a, maybe a lake that was closed for renovation. But essentially, we had 40 beaches that we were sampling um, in Iowa every week from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And we see a really strong increase in the number of advisories. So probably can't see because the chair is in the way, but 2008, flood year. Uh, many of our beaches were actually inundated with water in 2008. Um, 2009, also pretty wet. But then coming out of that, we saw a really dramatic increase in the number of advisories. And again, you have everything from drought years like 2012 to flood years like 2013. And even regardless of those kind of climate uh, differences, we're on this really strong upward trend. And in 2016, we had a record number of advisories. So we're going from one or two advisories to 37-ish advisories in 2016. Um, the other thing that was a little bit concerning for us was that we always had the bad actor lakes. Um, green Valley Lake is a really aptly named lake because it was green all the time and we had a number of advisories. So in the early days, the most advisories came from one or two lakes. But by the time we start getting into 14, 15, 16, you can see that now almost half the lakes have an advisory, at least one advisory. So we're not only seeing more advisories, we're seeing them in more locations. And that was concerning to us that we were starting to see that. Um, this gives you a, se a sense of the spatial spread uh, in terms of where we are seeing some of those advisories and the, the number of advisories. So Green Valley, one of our kind of lakes that has a lot of issues. Black Hawk Lake, we saw a lot of issues as well. But even our best lakes, um, Lakeside Lab is on the shores of West Okaboji, really nice lake. Um, still has blooms, not very often, but East Okaboji, Spirit Lake have really significant blooms as well. So um, not, not any place in Iowa, I think, could you say is not potentially vulnerable to these blue-green algae blooms. Next one. So one of the things I mentioned, we were working with the Department of Public Health. We had a partnership with them. Uh, we were one of a few states that was working with EPA and, and CDC to start tracking human illness uh, attributed to microcystin poisoning. Next. Um, so if there were uh, suspected cases of microcystin poisoning, that would be required by health providers to report that. And then working with those local uh, county officials about what was going on. Now, we know that uh, microcystin poisoning Oftentimes it's a liver or stomach kind of uh, thing, illness. So people feel nauseous. They feel a little crummy. But after you've been at the lake, you feel maybe crummy because maybe you drank too much, or you're out in the sun too much. We think we get a lot of underreporting still. And a lot of our local um, health providers aren't really thinking about, weren't thinking about microcystin, especially in the early days. Um, but if we saw an advisory, we'd let the local health officials know just so they could track that. And if you look at the number of cases, suspected cases of microcystin poisoning, these aren't huge numbers. These aren't 
you know, thousands of people that are becoming sick. Um, but it does tell you that there are some things to, to look out for. So, for example, in 2011, there was a triathlon that four cases of people became sick after a triathlon. Um, probably something to that because we did have an advisory at that lake. Um, so we do, we are seeing people become sick. Um, next case. And if you look at the complaint types, what really stands out to me, again, microcystin being more of a hepatotoxin, the liver toxin, some of these things like diarrhea, abdominal pain, you would expect with microcystin. Some of the other toxins like saxitoxin and anatoxin that are, that are more neurological that people don't think of happening in Iowa, we start to look at headache, fatigue, um, you get some people that are, have dizziness and that kind of thing, shortness of breath probably related to other toxins, not just microcystin. So we do think that we're seeing some of these other toxins occurring in Iowa, but we're not actively monitoring for that. Um, and that's a little bit of concern that we're not doing that. Um, in 2016, uh, as I was walking out the door, EPA came up with a new draft criteria for algal toxins, um, microcystin of four. So we were reporting at 20. And cylindrospermosin, which is another um, toxin that's out there at eight micrograms per liter. And these were based on children's recreational exposure. These are non-cancer endpoints, and there's a lot of research uh, showing some maybe liver cancer endpoints. What we see, and not too surprising, if you drop that threshold, the number of advisories really, really increases. And so one of the things that I think the state's wrestling with right now is should they go to that four micrograms per liter instead of 20? Um, some states have gone to six or eight. Um, I think that it's probably wise that the state think about at least dropping to 10, if not to that four micrograms per liter, and adding the other toxins like cylindrospermosin, anatoxin, and saxitoxin. Next. Um, one other thing I really wanted to mention quickly is that because of the potential to end up in drinking water, DNR did a, a quick survey um, using some state revolving funds to look at what was in our raw water. And if you saw a detection of microcystin in raw water, then they took a sample of finished water. Um, and we did see a lot of toxin in raw water, not at extremely high levels, um, but we saw a number, for example, 10 systems with a detection in one week, um, so 38% of systems in October. Now remember, the beach monitoring program ends Labor Day. So one of the gaps in our monitoring, one of the gaps in, in exposure is that the sampling, that the advisories don't go into September, October. Um, oftentimes we have nice conditions even still in November. So we are seeing uh, microcystin in our drinking water. And again, the, the system that had the most detections was Spirit Lake, Iowa. So again, you're up in the Okabojis, you're in some of the best lakes in Iowa, and Spirit Lake had detections into December. So we do know that we're having that, that potential issue. Next. Is that um, community water systems or private wells as well? So these are just community systems using surface water. And we basically said, if you're taking water from um, a lake, you are considered vulnerable and you, sh you should be doing this testing. Yeah. So raw water, is that before it's treated? Yes, so the raw water is... Water is okay. um, we did not see in this study anything, there was maybe one detection in the treated water. Um, but uh, for, because of some analytical issues, we are saying that only the raw water do we detect microcystin. Des Moines Water Works did not participate in this, but they do their own monitoring, and they actually did see um, levels above five, I think, in their, in their uh, finished water, and they put an advisory out as a result of that, and they were pulling from the Raccoon River at the time. Um, just quickly to kind of introduce what David's going to talk about in terms of climate change. One of the things that comes up in terms of uh, why are we seeing this increase, well one is nutrient levels, so uh, nitrogen is really perhaps a bigger driver than we've ever given it credit for. The other thing is that um, cyanobacteria like warm conditions. They outcompete, they perform best at higher water temperatures. So they kind of max out where all the other, you know, green algae give up. Uh, and so clearly climate change will have a role in intensifying these blooms. Uh, and also we see these early spring rains. We've had a couple of really big rains already in Iowa, you know, inch, two inch on sort of ground that's kind of vulnerable right now to some erosion and leaching of nitrogen. So we see a lot of nitrogen moving into our lakes. Um, the microcystis is right there to take advantage of it right away. So the thing that I'll say for Des Moines Water Works is they have been proactive at testing. They've been doing this testing for a long time, looking at both the cells and then also the microcystin toxin. 
Um, so yes, they are, they are proactively looking at that and proactively advising people to not drink when it gets above the drinking water um, advisory. It, it's not, it's a health advisory level, it's not an actual standard right now for microcystin, but they are being proactive. So yes, um, if we're looking at microcystin, we could debate about the nitrogen levels because of evidence to suggest that nitrate of four or five is maybe more harmful than we thought previously. Um, so they are currently meeting the drinking water standard, but we should be thinking about, you know, whether that's an appropriate standard or not. Next. All right, and just a quick uh, couple of acknowledgments and then toss it over to David. We're gonna, we're gonna move on to um, a, a little bit away from public health. Um, I'll try to go relatively quickly so we have some time for questions. But we did want to talk a little bit about a project that we've been doing here in Iowa that, that may be of interest to some of you in, in some other states. Um, and it does have public health implications. All right, um, so uh, essentially I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the Iowa annual climate statement. So what I'm going to tell you about is, is sort of what we thought was missing, what were the annual statements about, and how effective have they been. So uh, one of the issues with climate change is that the impacts often seem to be, to be far away, right? So especially if we're in an inland state like Iowa, you're always hearing about things like you know, polar bears and king tides and stuff like that. It seems like it's, it's uh, issues that are elsewhere. So go ahead. Um, also, the debate that, that, that you hear about seems to be between disconnected camps, right? Dif dif different people off in D.C., you know, maybe pundits in D.C. and researchers somewhere else, but, but um, not people that you uh, interact with. And then also, people don't really know what consensus means. You know, you hear, everybody's probably heard that, you know, 97% of scientists believe that climate change is happening and that it's caused by people. But what does that mean? What does it mean when 3% or 2%, you know, like... What do you make of that? And what do you make of it when you see people debating on, on television? Um, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to explore the idea of sort of local communication from local experts. Um, and so talking about Iowa to people in Iowa. Um, so maybe not, not, not for research publication, but for communication issues, which is, which is not something that we academics do all that frequently. So it was kind of an interesting project. Um, so when I say local communication, what I mean are things like, like here, this is a, an article, a, a um, figure that, uh, that Chris Anderson put together. And the idea is trying to communicate the idea of, well, you've heard about extreme weather. Well, what's happening in Iowa? Well, if you think about extreme weather, it means that there, there are a number of different things that can happen. And one thing we're seeing is um, a shift to uh, both drier and wetter periods. So the idea that, 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 that I've learned from this project to say is that Wetter, t wetter years become wetter, or wetter periods become wetter, and drier periods become drier, and that has to do with, uh, um, uh, with the hydrological cycle and what happens when you have more evaporation and so on. So what you see here is if, if, this, if this oval um, is the uh, uh, 95th percentile of, of if we're graphing May-June precipitation on the bottom and July-August precipitation along the um, y-axis, might as well just use this, uh, then, then, you, then sort of normal years are here. And what we're finding is that you get, um, if, if you look at uh, uh, the red being 1981 to 2013 and the blue being eight, 1893 to 1980, you see that, that, that most of the red years, certainly a, a anomalous number of red years are outside of that, of that range, right? And that's what we mean when we say that, that, um, that things are changing. But Again, I don't want this to be sort of a talk about climate change, but kind of what we did. So let's move on to the next slide. So what happened in 2011 was, and you can push. So um, for the first time, president, presidential candidates, it, it, it seems like it can't have been this recent, but really 2011 was the first time that, that, that presidential candidates were expressing real skepticism about climate change. Um, and so we were talking and kind of wanted conversations about science to be about science and and certainly political conversations about what should you do or what should you not do that's that's a different question right so we wanted to give a sense since a lot of people were here in iowa we wanted to give a sense of of what seemed to be going on here um, and so what we did was we mostly began with people who had worked on the iowa climate change advisory council which was a group that uh, that, that put together some reports um, in iowa back in the early 2000s 
and um, and we uh, had had some state climate researchers, so, so some folks up at Iowa State, they put together a one-page document on kind of what what we see, um, what we expect in Iowa, what we've seen in Iowa, and how that how that affects us. So they they wrote a, a one-page document um, of of changes that have been observed and modeled, um, and then we essentially wanted to get scientists that we knew right to to um, sign on to this. So we called around to a bunch of people and said, you know, uh, some, some uh, scientists have put together a statement. Would you, you know, be willing to sign on? How do you, what, what do you think about it? And so on. And we got about 32 signers from 22 colleges and universities. Um, and we used, we used then that, that document to, uh, to talk about climate change in, in 2011. Then 2012, we were, there, there was a drought. We decided that this had kind of worked pretty well. We wanted to do it again. Um, we and, and and once we've done it twice right now it's a thing uh so this one we had a little more time for we, we 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 once we had done it we sort of had some sense of what we what what we could do better and how we could uh contact more people and so on and so we spent more time planning this one more time um, looking to recruit people um so essentially moving beyond our, our circle of, of acquaintances and people that, that, that we may have known and you know, kind of looking people up and cold calling them and so on. Um, and we ended up with 138 science faculty from 27 colleges and universities signing on to this statement. And what we try to do with the, the, the statements is find people who are in, we, we call them climate and climate impacted fields, right? So certainly climatologists, but we're also, we're, we're looking for people from around the state um, and one of the reasons why we're looking for people around the state is that we're trying to create a, a, a system where you know I, I mentioned the idea of local uh, local experts and so on um, where if you have questions about climate maybe you're a reporter maybe you're just a, a person maybe you're looking for someone for for a talk um, if you have questions, then, then you can look at that list of, of signers and you see that there's someone near, near you, right? So in our effort to try to find uh, people in all parts of the state, we started, we started like I said, looking up you know, um, different, different science faculty that, uh, and, and talking to them. And I guess one thing I want to I point out that's kind of important for this is that you know, the research... Um, the research uh, faculty, they generally know each other, right? The, the, the folks who are doing climate change research at Iowa State and the University of Iowa, they, they, they know who they are and they, they talk a fair amount. But a lot of the people at other universities and colleges, um, so myself at Drake and people at Iowa Community Colleges and other people at other private uh, universities, um, where we're doing more teaching, right? We still do research, but we're, we're, where we're doing more teaching, we're generally not as plugged into that community, right? As as you are if you're doing research. And so one of the one of the things that that, that we've tried to do with this is is identify um, people to sort of plug into that community. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so anyway, the way we've been doing the, this, this process is essentially in the fall, we, we now um, have been soliciting uh, you know, ideas, right? So we, we ask, well, what, what, what are people interested in doing early spring? A core group gets together, brainstorms, identifies topic areas. Late spring, we bring in new expertise, right? So one year, and I'll mention this in a minute, one year we did a um, uh, uh, public health a statement about about you know how is climate change affecting and expected to affect public health in Iowa over the next uh, you know half century, and um, to do that we needed we needed a lot of folks with expertise that we didn't have because our initial statements tended to be about ag and and those sorts of things. All right, so anyway, so we f figure out once we've decided on a topic, we figure out who do we need to talk to, who needs to be involved, um, then we. Uh, uh, Put together a draft statement. We and, and that's probably a group of it's about 20 people that put together the draft statements, and then we um, send it out to all the people who have signed in the past, see if they're interested in signing on, and see if they have, have any comments, concerns. We have some some um, 
uh, phone calls and so on. And then we get the, the draft completed by the late summer. And then early October, we go ahead and release the statement. So um, there, these are the topics. And hopefully, you can see that it's a, a range of things. Um, the, the, when we did local health impacts, I wrote this one out a little bit more just because I thought you guys might be more interested. So one of the issues is, is extreme events, obviously. So, you know, extreme heat and cold, um, rain, floods, and some of the issues that come with floods that we, we've been talking about. Uh, water quality that, that, again, is affected by those sorts of things and al algal blooms. Um, but also respiratory health. So as, temper as, as, as you get dry periods, right, there's, there's uh, respiratory issues, there's pollen, um, a lot of work that's showing that, that, that pollen levels are increasing and so on. Um, the potential for new infectious diseases moving into the area as you don't, just, you don't kill the vectors. Uh, mental health issues that come from uh, a number of things, obviously from, from trauma, from things like floods and so on, but also as, as your, your environment around you, as your, your sense of, of place is changing, um, there are mental health impact, impacts there. Um, last year we did, it, it's not just the heat, it's the humidity, because the major thing actually in Iowa is um, an increase in humidity rather than an increase in temperature. And, um, but that has all kinds of other impacts, right, for if, if, if you can't cool down at night. Um, by this time, we're up to about 190 um, uh, scientists and educators in, from, from colleges and universities um, in climate and climate impacted fields. And uh, 39 Iowa colleges and universities are on there. So it's pretty much almost every, every um, college and university in Iowa that has people in this field um, have, have, have folks that, that have signed on. This year, we're going to talk about in infrastructure. So you can move on. Um, so, you know, how has this been as far as our, if our goal is to communicate issues that, that are related to science, uh, to, to, to climate change? How has this been going? Well, we've gotten a mix of local and, and national press. My students were most excited when, um, when we got one of the statements mentioned on the uh, Daily Show's uh, webpage. So that, I, I had to show that off in lecture for about three years, and then I finally backed <laughs> off of that one. But anyway, um, uh, uh, we've got, you know, so, so, so the, there, there's been press coverage. Um, the American Geophysical Union, the, 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 the second year we wrote this, they sent everybody out um, little thanks, thank you notes. Uh, so they were obviously paying attention. Um, it's led to a much wider range of Iowa contacts, right? So again, um, you know, there are 190 people now who are involved in some way. Um, and, you know, if I need to talk to somebody about something, I now have a, a whole, whole expanded range. Um, and hopefully other people do as well. And then that's also led, that also leads to speaking requests and so on, because again, you know, people now know um, who, uh, uh, you know, is involved in these sort of, sorts of issues. Um, but then there were also a whole bunch of unexpected benefits that I think, to, to me, really kind of drove home the value of doing a project like this. Um, one of them was that it greatly strengthened the community and communication between climate scientists um, and, and, and really the educators and the researchers, right? So uh, uh, again, the researchers have a community, but now the educators um, are also involved and we know who each other is and, and so on. And so it makes it much easier, you know, for me to call up Gene Tockley now and just, just say, hey, you know, I had this question. Um, and so on. So it's been really good, I think, for, for, for building a community in the state. Uh, also, we, we, we had, once we had been doing this for a little while, we said, well, let's have a conference and, um, and talk about, about climate education, climate issues, and, and um, those sorts of things, uh, especially climate communication. I think a lot of us have been using this process as a way of, of learning more and more about, about climate communication and what people, what people hear and um, what they understand. So anyway, so, so a lot there. Um, it's deepened and expanded, I think, the expertise um, in uh, climate issues that among science faculty in Iowa, just the process of kind of working through the drafts and, and you know, or looking to see whether you want to sign on and so on. I know that, you know, being in Des Moines, I'm often asked to do climate, climate talks. Um, that's not my main field of research, um, but I know a lot more now than I did before. So, uh, so again, it's been really, really useful for that. And I think that's, I think people across the board feel that. Um, some, some concerns that come up, you know, often we're always, we're, we're putting together essentially a one page document that says, you know, here's what we are uh, convinced about 
on this topic. Like, here's what we know about, about um, you know, public health and climate change in Iowa, right? Um, so it, it, we're always, we're always ar arguing about sort of how to balance, you know, science and what comes across as advocacy. Are we just, are we just explaining, you know, um, what we know? Are we trying to move the needle on the conversation? How does, how does that work? And, and obviously, we, well, we've, we've tended to um, frustrate some people by kind of focusing on like avoiding advocacy wherever possible. Um, but that's also why most of the scientists in the state, state are willing to sign on and say, yeah, that's, that's the, right, the right science on that topic. Um, uh, so again, what's known, what's speculation, you know, how, 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 how do we balance that? Um, learning how to communicate better, that's been, a, that's been a huge deal for us. And then, um, you know, what's our role? What are we, what are we trying to do as science, as, as, um, with, with these, these documents and so on, and what are we trying to do as a group. So that, th those have been some things that we've spent a fair amount of time talking about. And this is just the, uh, the, this year's team. Um, uh, so folks from UI, ISU, UNI, and me, we've been getting together and, and putting the, the document together. Um, but again, it depends a lot on, on the topic who's, who's on that main team.